Mandalorian. Look outside. They are waiting for you. Unsurprisingly, there are numerous Easter eggs and references to other Star Wars stories peppered throughout The Mandalorian's second episode, and I'm here to show you the most interesting ones the show has to offer, with 10 tiny details you may have missed in The Mandalorian. There were rumors the Empire was working on a weapon to neutralize Mandalorian armor, that it had even been tested on our people. I, I didn't believe it. Everyone wants Beskar. As we first saw in the first episode of The Mandalorian, Beskar iron is highly coveted and extremely valuable. This metal is a critical part of Mandalorian culture and an important piece of their history. In the second episode, the Razor Crest is looted by scavenging Jawas. Our hero must trek across the valleys of Avala 7 to try to negotiate the return of his ship's materials. Our friend, Kiel, mediates the talks and asks the Jawas what they would ask in return for the parts. Upon seeing his iconic armor, the Jawas assume it is Beskar and ask for the armor in exchange for the parts. Of course, this deal is not acceptable to the Mandalorian, and a new arrangement is negotiated. However, this line is still important as it serves to reinforce the galactic reverence of Mandalorian iron and craftsmanship across all cultures. The Mandalorian agrees instead to retrieve an egg for the Jawas, and must fight a massive rhinoceros-like creature called a Mudhorn. After the battle with the Mudhorn, we can see that his armor is badly dented and bent out of shape, suffering extreme disfigurement at the Mudhorn's massive strength. All of his armor, that is, except for the Beskar. While the rest of his armor is mangled violently, his helmet and pauldron do not even suffer a dent. This is a very intentional yet subtle way of showing us just how superior Beskar truly is. And leaves us with the question, what about the legendary ding mark in Boba Fett's helmet? Ezra, the armor I wear is 500 years old. I reforged it to my liking, but the battles, the history, the blood, all lives within it. And the same goes for every Mandalorian. This armor is part of our identity. It makes us Mandalorians who we are. You lie to us. What a surprise. Well, he didn't exactly lie, he just didn't tell us the whole truth. Well said, and some of the truth is better than none of the truth, which is what you used to get, so don't try and tell me that I have not grown. The second episode of The Mandalorian features many small details that have huge payoffs. This follows the principle of the Russian playwright Anton Chekhov, which says that one must never place a loaded rifle on the stage if it isn't going to go off. It's wrong to make promises you don't mean to keep. To oversimplify, the concept of Chekhov's gun is all about setup and payoff, and the Mandalorian does well to deliver on this idea. Before agreeing to trade with the Jawas, the Mandalorian first attempts to chase after them. He lands several killing blows on the Jawas, and if you pay attention, you probably notice that he has to reload his rifle after every shot he fires. Now, this is interesting in itself, as it's the first time we've seen reloading take place in a Star Wars movie or TV series. As the Sandcrawler drives away, or crawls away, the Mandalorian fires one last time at the rear of the sand crawler. When this fails to stop it, he drops the rifle on the ground without reloading and chases after the sand crawler on foot. Before battling the Mudhorn on behalf of the Jawas, the Mandalorian checks his armor and weapons. He makes sure his ammo is strapped to his chest and that his van braces are secured and that his vibro blade is in his boot. However, he forgets to make sure his rifle is loaded. In the opening moments of the battle, the Mandalorian aims and fires his rifle, only to find that it is still empty. He tries to reload it, but the mud jams the loading mechanism, and the Mandalorian is forced to re-adapt. 
During the fight, we see the remainder of his arsenal fail as his armor peels, his van brace falls off, and his blaster pistol is lost in the mud, leaving him with only his vibroblade. The vibroblade itself sparks with electricity, which seems to be a nice reference to the vibroblades made famous in Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. You cannot win, Revan. Here, make yourself useful. Oh, Mandalorian! I can get a lot for this on the black market. You will be giving it back. When the Jawas are angered by the Mandalorian's presence, Kiul suggests that the Mandalorian should remove his weapons to make the Jawas feel more comfortable, to which he responds, I'm a Mandalorian. Weapons are part of my religion. While many may assume this is simply a comical way to protest, the line is an entirely factual statement about Mandalorian culture. As discussed in the previous video, the Mandalorian culture is built on war and conquest. A warrior's weapon and armor is indeed honored and a sacred right, not to be forfeit lightly, if ever. My name's Kandorus of the Mandalorian clan Ordo. I've been fighting across the galaxy for 40 of your years. For my people, it is the honor and glory of battle that rules us. It's through combat that we prove our worth, gain renown, and make our fortunes. Mandalorian! Yeah? This R2 unit has a bad motivator, look! Hey, what are you trying to push on us? <laughs> Throughout the episode, there are many shots that tell us the Mandalorian's armor has electrical infrastructure. First, we see the Mandalorian repairing his chest plate, and we can see a series of wires and circuits on the inside of the metal. And then when we see his van brace spurting electricity during a malfunction later in the episode. While I didn't mention this in the last video, the first episode also shows that his armor has wires and status lights under his pauldron. With these details appearing two episodes in a row, I can't help but think about Chekhov's gun and that these details may be important later on. Okay, so this weapon only targets Mandalorian armor, right? So why not make your armor out of something different? You may take Captain Solo to Jabba the Hutt after I have Skywalker. He's no good to me dead. The opening scene of the second episode shows the Mandalorian attacked by another group after the baby Yoda creature, yet to be named. Two moves into the fight, the Mandalorian notices a tracking fob in the belt of the first assailant and pushes the carriage out of the way to protect the child. When the attackers are defeated, the Mandalorian looks to the ground to confirm that the device was indeed a bounty guild tracking fob, confirming that there are already other hunters on the way to seize his quarry. He's all yours, bounty hunter. Reset the chamber for Skywalker. Look at me. Just me by my size, do you? Hmm? Hmm. And where you should not. For my ally is the Force. And a powerful ally it is. Life creates it. Makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us. And binds us. Yoda was one of the most powerful Jedi in known history, and almost nothing is actually known about his species. The only other member of his species seen in canon before now was Yaddle, the female Yoda who sat on the Jedi Council in The Phantom Menace. With Yoda being as powerful as he is, and all canon and legends characters of his species being Jedi, many are suspicious that his entire species may be force sensitive and rightfully this suspicion was extended by many to the baby retrieved by the Mandalorian. And while the truth is confirmed later in the episode, there are several accounts of foreshadowing that point to this. When walking through the canyons, the Mandalorian and baby Yoda species are followed by a trail of lizards. While unconfirmed at first, it can be inferred that these lizards are attracted to the baby through the force, and they disperse when the baby senses the oncoming attackers. 
All of this points forward to the episode's climax where the baby saves the Mandalorian from the Mudhorn, lifting it with the Force and exhausting himself to protect him. Finally, regarding Baby Yoda, when the Mandalorian reunites with Kiel, the baby toddles playfully after one of the lizards in the background. The Mandalorian turns around to find the baby eating the lizard whole, possibly a nod to our first introduction to Master Yoda himself. Put that down. Now we Hey! It's my dinner! <coughs> How you get so big to do food of this kind? Listen, friend. R2? R2-D2, it is you! It is you! In A New Hope, the Jawas are introduced as the first alien creatures seen in Star Wars. They ride across the desert in massive brown structures called sand crawlers. However, what you may not know is that the Jawas did not create the sand crawlers. Being scavengers and not builders, the Jawas found the sand crawlers left behind by long gone settlers of Tatooine, while legends had identified the Circa Corp as the original owners of these crawlers, Canon has yet to tell us where they come from. With these Jawas decidedly not on Tatooine, it is unclear whether these crawlers were left behind by the same ones who once settled Tatooine or if these Jawas migrated and brought the crawler along with them, though that's a logistical feat. Although the red eyes of these Jawas seem to indicate a separate group from their Tatooine brethren. And while we're talking about Jawas, this episode answers the question that we all wanted to know. When the Mandalorian returns to them with the egg, they crack it open with a victorious cry and they feast, confirming once and for all that Jawas are indeed not wearing masks. You are free to use any methods necessary, but I want them alive. No disintegration. Before the Mandalorian relinquishes his weapons, he concedes the point that he did disintegrate a few of them. Obviously, this is a reference to the infamous instructions given by Darth Vader specifically to Boba Fett. But this time, we actually get to see what that might look like. We can see the Mandalorian using his rifle to totally disintegrate a handful of Jawas. And looking closely, you may have noticed that he also disintegrated one of the Bounty Guild attackers from the episode's opening. Yeah? Good. Aside from the color scheme, the Mandalorian's helmet differs only slightly from those worn by Jango and Boba Fett with one obvious omission. The first is clearly his is Beskar and theirs aren't because of the ding, but second, the side mounted viewfinder. From some of the close up shots, you may have noticed that his helmet actually has slots on the side where the Fett's viewfinder would mount, telling us these are likely attachments rather than permanent fixtures. Later in the episode, when the Mandalorian enters the Mudhorn's cave, he sees around the cave using a light that is emitted from his helmet. If we look closely, we can see a cylindrical outline to the sides of the helmet, telling us that this is not part of the helmet, but was a flashlight that was attached to it at some point off screen. Whether we will see the Mandalorian attach other tools to his helmet or build on his armor, we will have to wait and see. Get on board. I did too. I did uh, um, chapter two and chapter six. Those are mine. And so um, one of them's showing tonight. So I'm super excited <laughs> to see it on the big screen at the El Capitan of all things. So it's uh, it's great. So I, I, they, they got me on board for two and I was like, I'll do them all if I could. <laughs> The first episode of The Mandalorian was directed by Dave Filoni, beloved by many for his work on Star Wars The Clone Wars, and the new episode was directed by Rick Famuyiwa, who also directed episode 6. 
the episode told us a much more personal story with lower stakes, where the progress was less about events and more about growth of the characters and changing perspectives. With The Mandalorian giving several directors the chance to give their take on Star Wars, I'm excited to see what we will get next. Bounty hunting is a complicated profession. 